they think you might be hanging out from. But um, so just give a, a second here as people people get connected, get tuned in. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, we'll be spending oh about an hour of time tonight. Um, we got some great presentations from Karen and Matt to go over um, first calling. And then second thing we will look at is uh, selection, making those primary selections at 16 weeks. Because I think the emphasis here tonight is really about getting those breeders prepared. They're actually weeding through the, the flock of birds that you might have hatched in the spring. And uh, they're about 15, 16, maybe 18 weeks old, whatever the case is when you're going to make this selection. And uh, our panel will talk about that tonight. But uh, realizing that most of those birds are probably not suitable for your breeding flock, And you want to go ahead and and uh, select the very best. And so that's kind of the, the, the emphasis that we have tonight. Would that be, be fair, Karen? Is that, where, yeah. is that where we're going? All right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I guess with that, we're about two minutes into this. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So the format here, just if you're coming in, um, our first half of our hour together, roughly speaking, we're in broad terms here, will be uh, the presentation part, our program part. And we're not going to do a lot of, or any really, probably answers to questions during that time. Uh, we'll do that in the second half. And the reason for that is we'll, that way we can chop up um, Karen and Matt's portion and post that as a nice standalone video that'll live on YouTube as a reference. And then... Um, <laughs> For the for for people to see for for all four people to see in the future, um, and uh, and then we'll we'll cut that out and we'll do the live Q and A portion after that. And um, very happy to to have Karen on here. Um, Matt, of course, was uh, on the first one with Aaron that we did here the the Apple live stream uh, as part of the Heritage Poultry Breeders um, segments that we've been doing. Um, this is, this is turning out to be kind of a fun thing. We're going to try to stabilize on the fourth Tuesday of the month for you guys that are just coming in to listen now. Um, I know I realize we, we busted that this month, but that's my fault. I was on the road last week, and it was going to be hard doing um, this live stream from a, from a parking lot or a rest stop. So so we did move it. Um, but I've, I've been had the pleasure to uh, to know Karen and Matt going all the way back into their SPN days and, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about their breeding stuff. So we're going to, I'm going to stop talking now. We're going to bring Karen on and she's going to bring her, her, she has a PowerPoint and she's going to walk us through the calling. So welcome Karen. Hello. <laughs> you ready to go? Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> all right. You want your, you want your PowerPoint up? Yeah. So I'm Karen. <laughs> I've been breeding for just under six years. So I'm a small breeder. I only have about 20 breeding hens per breed. So I only had about 120 chicks per breed each spring. So six years isn't very long, just getting started. But I have had luck to work with a lot of great teachers in the past. Um, so what is selection? I'm sure someone out there has a good definition, but for me, it boils down to picking which birds you're going to breed from and which ones just aren't good enough. This is a huge topic that cannot come close to being covered in a short online session, especially by me, but we will have to try to hit the basics. I do want to note that I can only speak to my method. What I do as a small breeder, what works for me will not work for everyone. Plus my method is ever evolving. When Matt takes over for the good part later, you'll see he's breeding a much larger scale. So he has a different perspective that may resonate better with you. Is anyone wondering why select breeding fowl at all? If you ask your kids or grandkids, they will tell you that the next generation of humans is way better than the previous one. That just isn't so for chickens. If you breed all your chickens together that you happen to have, your future generations are going to get worse and worse. My whole goal as a poultry breeder is to work to get as close to the standard as possible, so I want my flock to get better in time. Therefore, I need to select the best birds to work with. 
In my opinion, selection and record keeping are what differentiate the true breeders from the hatcheries and the peddlers. The more chicks you hatch from each year, and the pickier you are with which ones you keep, the faster your progress will be in meeting your goals. Since I'm talking to APA members tonight, most of you need to make some money off your birds in order to be sustainable. So the more birds you hatch and the er more you cull, the sooner you will have birds in the sales pipeline as well. How do I select breeding fowl? Well, you're looking for the best representatives of the breed you can find. No bird is perfect, and it's up to each breeder to decide what they will or will not tolerate. The vigor of my stock is the most important trait I look for. For me, this is the easiest selection of criteria and accounts for more than half my calls. The next criteria is type. This is where my breed standard comes in. How is the bird supposed to be built? It's phenotype. Then comes utility. Is this bird productive, useful? And the American Poultry Association standard of perfection, which is the breed standard that applies to me, there is an economic quality listed for most breeds. To me, this is just as important as the physical attributes and color descriptions. And then breeder's choice. This is not a normally listed selection criteria, but not everything about your bird will be written in the standard. Broodiness, temperament, and foraging ability are examples of hereditary traits rarely listed in the official standard. Exact production quality is also not listed. The Leghorn standard doesn't call for a 320 egg pullet season. The Delaware standard doesn't call for a market ready bird at 12 weeks, but yet those may be the exact kind of goals an individual breeder may set for themselves. Birds weights are also a range. Standard bred birds should be within 20% of the standard weight. For my Rhode Island Reds, that means I get to decide if I want my hens to be on the upper or lower end of the 5.2 to 7.8 weight range. You also get to pick what are your acceptable faults or defects. In fact, you almost need to. You cannot fix everything wrong with a bird at the same time. You will need to prioritize your focus and tackle a few issues at a time. That said, I personally don't choose to, choose to allow any qualifications, disqualifications. Disqualifications are listed in the standard in two places. The general disqualifications that apply to all breeds are listed in the front of the standard of perfection. Then the more specific breed disqualifications are in the breed listings. To me, any trait bad enough to have a bird immediately dismissed from the showroom is one I don't want, even if exhibition isn't my main goal. I trust in the master breeders of the past, know that they knew more about poultry than I do, and that anything they label the disqualification probably won't make my birds healthier or more productive if I choose to tolerate it. Let's take a moment to define the difference between selecting and culling. They're often used interchangeably, but I'm going to try to use them consistently going forward. I'm going to preach about culling. Matt's going to discuss selection. To me, culling can happen at any time and goes on forever. A bird can be great until the day it isn't. We will go over some of the things I cull for, but I do want you to know that culling does not mean to put them to immediate death, unless, of course, it is inhumane to keep them alive at that point. Some breeders I know physically move their culls to a different pen. That leaves the remaining birds in contention as breeders more space and does not require you to have individual birds marked. Since my birds are individually marked, they get to stay with their siblings, but they get recorded as a cull and I continue raising them out. After all the inferior birds have been culled, you are left with a group of adequate specimens that go head to head in selection. Everyone will come into breeding poultry at a different point in the bird's life. At some point, no matter how you acquire your breeding stock, you will need to select eggs to set, hatch young, raise them out, and eventually decide who goes in the breeding pen. Before we look at all the pictures coming up, I do want to mention that this process is uncomfortable for every breeder at first, and it's especially uncomfortable to do it online. <laughs> I find when talking to new breeders, they fall naturally into two camps. One group looks out at their flock of juveniles and thinks to themselves, wow, they're beautiful. I love them all. The other group looks out at their flock and only sees faults. It's easy to get discouraged when that's all you see. It's important for a breeder to pause and also acknowledge how their birds excel as well. Try to strike a balance. Obviously, they aren't all perfect. That bird doesn't exist, but even mediocre flocks probably have a few standouts that can be turned into something great over time with a good breeder's attention. So let's get to some culling. First cull for me is when I choose what eggs to incubate. We're not going into incubation here, but there are a few breed characteristics and vigor tests that each egg needs to pass. You want eggs to be the correct size for the breed, but honestly, not too many breeds in the standards of perfection 
specify egg size. The Blue Andalusian standard is one that specifically calls for a large egg, so obviously you aren't going to set medium or extra large eggs. For those of us whose breed standard doesn't specify, you definitely want to pick sizes that are in line with your goals. Egg size is partially genetic, so if you set all medium-sized eggs, don't be surprised if those hens grow up to lay medium-sized eggs. Next is egg color. We talked about the Andalusian before. Their standard calls for chalk white eggs, so a breeder of those would not set a cream white egg or a speckled white egg. My Rhode Island Red standards call for eggs to be brown to dark brown, so I have a range of acceptable shades. A breeder of a breed like Well Summers Morans or their Americanas will pay special attention to egg color, although they need to make sure it's not the only thing they are selecting for. Lastly, I want my nice eggs to have a nice shell, one that I'd be proud to put in an egg carton. It takes a healthy mom to put out consistently nicely shelled and shaped eggs. Eventually, hatch day comes. I, want, I do not assist in hatching. I want chicks that are strong for the beginning. I also never keep chicks as breeders if they are the last stragglers to hatch. Sometimes management may be the issue. Maybe I collected eggs for too long or kept them at differing temperatures before setting. But to be safe, I always exclude the last of all hatches from contention. Speaking of management, every once in a while I lose track of the pedigree of a chick. Maybe I didn't mark the egg correctly or I put it in the wrong hatching tray. But if I don't know whose the parents are, I just can't keep it. The, then there are the easy ones. Any bird hatched with physical deformities get cold. Some defects are obvious, like a yolk sac that has not been absorbed correctly. Sometimes they are less obvious. If you look at this chick, not only does it have an opening in its abdomen, it also has slightly curled feet that I wouldn't want to keep. You also want to look for other foot de deformities, like webbing between the toes. After the chicks have had a few hours out of the hatcher to get their sea legs, I like to pick each one up and check it over closely. I gently hold it by the neck, rub a finger up over its abdomen, and look for both eyes to be open and bright. I check the beak for any sign of an alignment problem, then I run my fingers over its back and sides, feeling for any scabs or anything that doesn't feel right. I look at its little dangling legs and toes to make sure they look good, and then check the vent. Lastly, I put them down on a towel to walk around. I want them to walk readily, with no signs of awkward gait or sitting oddly on their haunches. I am looking for bright, active chicks not sleepy, pitiful chicks. During the health check, I'm also looking for any visible, non-standard traits. These traits go to type what you should expect a bird to look like. Here we have two newborns with feathers on their legs. What's the big deal? Well, it may be nothing. The one on the left is a hatchery, light Brahma. It's supposed to have feathers on its legs. It's good to go. But the one on the right is a black Australorp, a clean-legged breed, so it's a cull. We're going to use black australorp chicks for the next examples, too. Here's one with bright yellow feet and one with dullish whitish feet. Is this important? Well, the standard calls for pinkish white feet, so another call. One more slightly complicated example. The one on the left has the traditional black, white, and yellow chick down coloring. But one year I had some hatch with reddish tint on their heads and cheeks. The standard did not have the answers for me this time, so I had to go to other sources. Luckily, I was able to find out from my breeder that rust in the chick down will translate into rust in the feathers of the adult birds, so I knew early that this one was a cull, but people love unique birds as pets. I do want to emphasize again that except for true physical defects, my culled chicks are retained to sell to pet homes or for meat. I don't kill the poor babies just because they're the last to hatch, have poor coloring, or I mismarked them. If they make it through the first few days, they are available for sale. One question that usually occurs to new breeders right about now is, so what? Who cares if they have rust in their feathers or yellow feet? Everybody understands that physical defects affix, affect a bird's ability to be a productive chicken, but it's a little harder to understand why the color or other cosmetic things matter. I can only speak for myself here, but for me, it's all about trust. When somebody gets a bird from me, I feel they deserve to get a bird that looks like it should. Pretend it's a dog. What if you wanted a golden retriever and you ordered one from a breeder? When you go to pick it up, it has six toes and spots like a Dalmatian. Now, nothing wrong with that. It's probably going to be a good, healthy dog, but it's just not what you're expecting. It's just not a golden retriever. That's how I feel about the chicken breeds. The bird's type, color, and utility all go into making a Rhode Island Red a Rhode Island Red. 
There's not a lot to look for over the next few weeks in the brooder. I continue to observe them and look for any signs of weakness. If I see one that tends to hang off away from its siblings, I'll throw a leg band on it and see if it was a fluke of timing or does it self-isolate often. If it was a fluke, I take off the band and move on. If it's consistently like that, I will call that chick. If one chick shows any sign of illness and the rest don't, it will be marked as a call. You also want to keep looking for all the same things you look for at hatch. When calling, you don't start stop looking for faults just because they didn't have them last time. You just start adding more traits to watch for in what develops or becomes more obvious as they grow and feather in. Now the birds are older and moving out to pasture. Once they're outside, there's a whole lot more ways for them to get into trouble. Does one bird repeatedly get its head stuck in the fencing? Is there one bird that rarely leaves the coop while everyone else can't wait to get out in the morning? Does one bird show symptoms of coccidiosis while the rest are fine? I'm starting to track and cull for those things at this point. I usually start weighing a little later than I used to now that I have past growth charts to compare against, but by six weeks I expect my bird's weights to be pretty uniform. The biggest ones often won't get to stay, and anyone under the median is also in trouble. This bottom picture is of an eight-week-old black ostler from my first year raising them. They were born in early February, and this was taken on April 1st, so it's not like they grew up in the heat and didn't need to develop feather cover. I had 10 chicks out of the 100 who were very slow to feather iron. I took these pictures, panicked a little bit, <laughs> and called my breeder. They reassured me that it was normal and they were fine. Turns out, in the end, they were perfectly normal looking, and all of them ended up being males. So I have some slow feathering males in my line. Is that great? Well, I'm still not so sure because every few years I get calls about chicks who must have lice or mites because they just aren't feathering out like everyone else. I internally groan and tell them it's okay, say hello to some of your boys, but it reminds me to put that on the list of things that may need attention. By week eight, you will want to separate your males from your females if possible to give them their best chance at thriving. Every breeder has different tells on every breeder. Every breed has different tells on gender, but it should be pretty obvious by now which is which. I also suggest assigning each bird a number and making sure you are keeping records on the individual birds going forward. While you are separating them, it is a good time to check out a few things that are accessible at this age. I check all my males for crooked pelvic bones. Males can pass this down to their daughters and it makes for a poor egg layer. I lifted these pictures straight out of the call of the hen by Walter Hogan. You want a bird with a nicely curved C-shaped pelvic bones. Straighter pelvic bones are also okay, but you do not want one se severely curved in like the second picture. Laying eggs will be very painful for this bird and she will avoid it. I also do an eye color check now. I'm looking for both eyes and let me repeat both eyes <laughs> to be nice and dark. Let me warn you though, this blurry picture is an eight-week-old Wellsummer. Their standard calls for a reddish bay eye. Now that's a weird color, and reddish bay is not in my color vocabulary, but I was pretty sure this wasn't it. I panicked, called about, and honestly didn't get an answer. But since all of them were this way, there was nothing to do but carry on. Gradually, as they aged, their eyes did change color. So for that breed, it was too early to check for eye color. Y'all will discover what you can and cannot judge at this age, but I encourage you to try to do some culling as the females are more than ready to be sold at this point. From now until butchering age, I take notes on the birds, trying to record traits or behaviors that might not be obvious on the day of selection. These are not necessarily black or white things that signal an automatic cull, but part of a bird's record. They can be positive th things that earn the bird's points or negative things that weigh against them. I breed big birds. I need good strong legs and hips. I record anyone who catches my eye for an unnatural gait or limping. Turkey breeders especially need to watch for this. If you don't note who it is, you may miss it on selection day. I like a bird who heads out to the pasture. Dashing to the feeder immediately is not what I consider foraging. I will sometimes sit and observe who goes where when I open the door. If any of my birds were to save a family by dragging them out of a burning building, that would be a positive note in their record. Temperament is a big one for me, and it's more about more than just human aggression. I want a confident bird. I don't want terrified birds. I like leaders, but not bullies. Is there one bird that sits by the coop door and doesn't let the others in without pecking at them? That would be a negative on her record. 
Is everyone roosting at night except for those two? And yes, if any bird was to show aggression towards humans, that would also be a call for me. For me. Before I finally allow Matt to speak, let me take you on one more little ride. One of the most common questions is, exactly how many birds do I need to start breeding? Well, the answer to that largely depends on your goals, but let's run through a scenario that can help illustrate how it usually goes in real life. Let's say you start off with four dozen eggs, either hatching eggs from another breeder or eggs from your adult birds. The first cull before setting knocks seven eggs out of contention, so you are putting 41 eggs into the incubator. Turns out the stock that laid your eggs was well fed and vigorous and you have a nice 90% fertility rate. You'll be moving 37 eggs into the hatcher. Your luck holds and you get a respectable 90% hatch rate. You have 33 chicks. Unfortunately, one little guy was a little bit too eager and hatched before absorbing his yolk, down to 32. Which ones of the remaining 32 will be good enough to become your breeder birds? Now we go into our second call at hatch. This one was the last to hatch and these two don't meet our standards. During brooding, one chick came down with pasty butt, so it's off the team. At four weeks, they head out to pasture. Unfortunately, we lose one to a giant snake. One day, you notice one has a dirty beak. Upon closer examination, you find a cross beak. When we separate the males from the females, uh, we also see that there's one bird much lighter than the other males. As the male's combs fill out, you notice one has a side sprig. That's a disqualification. You check the boy's pelvic bones and they are all good, except this guy. Next week, you discover a girl with a huge crop in the morning. You make a note and she's the same way the next morning. While you don't know exactly what's going on at this point and she may recover, it's not worth the chance of passing on a weak crop gene. About a month after you separated the sexes, you notice there's a male in with the girls. I call these sleeper males, ones that don't mature until they are safely away from all the other boys. While this is an admirable survivor instinct, I don't want to breed from those males. In the week leading up to selection, it becomes obvious that this girl is always limping, although you can't quite figure out why. This boy is just too anxious. He will never make a good flock leader and his anxiety will mostly spread to his hens. So here we are, we're at butchering age, and we have nine males to choose breeders from and 10 pullets. Note, we also probably have three girls to sell as pets and seven males to cook up for tailgating. Matt will talk about how to pick the breeders, but if we want to make improvements in our breed, we want to keep the top 10%. Top so that's, well, I guess we'll round up to one whole bird. But wait, do you want to base your whole breeding program off of one male? Probably not. <laughs> So maybe we forego improvement this generation and settle for maintaining quality and keep three males. We have 10 girls left at this point who are nowhere near mature enough to select as breeders, but with these kind of numbers, I have a feeling you'll end up with almost all of them in the breeding pen, again, forgoing improvement this year. And as the eternal chant of the breeder goes, next year I will do better and hatch more chicks. That's all. All right. Thank you. I tried Karen. to be fast, Matt. <laughs> great. Oh, you did all right. <laughs> great. Yeah, it did great. Um, all right. Let's keep right on rolling, Matt. The floor is yours. Once we get to 16 weeks, um, it is time to make preliminary selection. And uh, 16 weeks, is, it might sound a little arbitrary, but for a lot of dual purpose heritage birds, you are going to want to send your excess males to slaughter shortly after that six week day. So you don't wanna carry a bunch of extra males that uh, aren't gonna be in your breeding pen. So 16 weeks is a pretty good, it's pretty good timing to, uh, to make your selections. And uh, let me, uh, just as a caveat, I do, hatch and breed uh, quite a few more birds than Karen does. And so my young bird culling process is not near as intensive. Um, I do go through and look at all the chicks as they hatch and handle them again as we move them from the brooder to the grow out pens. But they spend a lot of, they're, they're out there in the grow outs from four weeks to 16 weeks 
um, without a lot of extra handling. So I may have a few more of these uh, cull traits showing up at selection time than uh, someone like Karen, who's who's uh, spending a lot of time with her birds on a daily and weekly basis and identifying some of these characteristics, uh, you know, as as the birds grow. So I'm a little more hands off through the through the growing uh, period and really set and focus on these birds at, at 16 weeks. And uh, I too have been doing this about six or seven years. I started about the same time Karen did. Um, and based on our S old SPN uh, training, uh, Karen helped put together a spreadsheet that I really like to use for, uh, for the selection process. And uh, one of the reasons I like this is especially for a newbie as I was, I really f like to be able to rely on data rather than talent. Um, a lot of the old timers can look at birds and stand, get them up on the table and get a good look at them and, and make pretty good selections uh, from a distance or, or briefly handling a bird. I felt like it was important for me to, as as someone new to this to kind of learn it and handle the birds one at a time and go through them and come up with a score uh, based on a series of attributes here. And uh, if you look at this, you know, we've got weight, we've got skull width, heart girth, uh, back flatness, body depth, pelvic width, keel shape, feet, comb, color. So we've got 10 attributes that uh, we really are gauging uh, how we're, how we're going to grade these birds. And I use a five point scale. So each of these categories is assigned uh, five points. So the perfect bird, which as Karen said, doesn't exist, would be worth 50 points. And so what I like to do at 16 weeks is get these birds up on the show tables so you can uh, get them up there and really and observe them, observe their stance, observe, observe their carriage. Uh, get to make sure they're conforming with uh, the the type of bird, you know that you've uh, you've spent time with your with your standard and you're looking at the uh, silhouettes of those birds, and so you, obviously the, your birds need to be recognizable uh, from the breed standpoint. But as we get into the uh, the grading part, um, the first thing that we need to do is weigh all those birds. <clears throat> We're here uh, breeding for utility and selecting breeders that are the appropriate weight. They're gonna create birds that also retain, or theoretically, they're gonna create birds that also retain the appropriate weight. And so we want to put every bird that uh, is still a candidate at 16 weeks up on a scale and, and really, in my case, um, that's gonna identify in a lot of cases, the top half, and in some cases, the top third. Um, as my as my birds get better, um, they do get more consistent, and so there is a little more uh, birds that you know that make the cut weight wise. But uh, early on, especially when I was starting with hatchery birds, um, you know the scale was the scale was identifying the top twenty five percent and eliminating the bottom seventy five percent right out of the gate and so i like to uh i like to get a, a weight on the birds get them sorted by weight and then uh <clears throat> based on the weights that are that that rate the highest start handling the birds and you start at the you start at the head of the bird and uh you start looking at the that skull width. And like I said, a lot of the old timers can look at the head of the bird and really, uh, really feel like they can tell a lot about that bird just based on the, the shape and the size of that head relative to the rest of the bird. I'm not, uh, I'm not there yet. And so I measure uh, skull width uh, and I'm not, not taking a tape measure to it. I'm just uh, using my hands to, to identify the, a good skull width at the same time, you can check eyes, eye color. You can check the beak and beak color and make sure you got the head shape that is suitable for your, uh, for your breed. Um, 
I like to handle the birds uh, by placing the uh, bird breast down in the palm of my hand. Um, if you guys aren't used to, you folks aren't used to handling birds, um, that is a fairly comfortable way. It's comfortable for the bird, um, especially my pullets. They relax fairly quickly and you can maneuver them around and you can assess very par various parts of the body um, while they sit. And so in my case, I'm left-handed. So I put the bird in my right hand, keel down in the palm of my hand, and then I can uh, assess the head, you know, move down the body of the bird and, and check the back end and down to the feet, all while that bird's uh, resting in the palm of my hand. And so while I'm looking at the skull, I also take a look at the comb. Um, Karen made a good point about uh, a lot of these uh, attributes that make up the type of the bird um, being important that the bird uh, identifies as as the breed it's, it's supposed to be. Um, when I'm going through birds at 16 weeks, though, these combs aren't necessarily very well developed. And so, um, especially with the pullets, they're, uh, they're pretty little pink immature combs. And so my comb evaluation at 16 weeks on the pullets is just identifying comb type. You know, if it's a, if it's a breed, all my breeds are single comb breeds. Uh, I need to have a single comb. I can count points. Um, it's a good, good opportunity to look for side sprigs, which is a disqualifier. But I don't, uh, you know, in the in a production system, I don't weigh combs uh, very heavily, and I don't make huge distinctions uh, based on combs, especially uh, at this young. Later on in the game, when we're doing final selections, combs will weigh a little more heavily into the into the process. But uh, right now, uh, not so much. And so then we move down the body of the bird and we're gonna lay our hand across the back and, and measure the, the heart girth. When we're, when we're talking heart girth, we're talking about uh, heart and lung capacity. You want a you wanna bird with adequate width there, they're, they're not pinched. At the same time, you run your hand down their back. You're looking for a long, flat back with uh, plenty of meat on the hip bones. Um, obviously, you don't want a, a, a bony bird. You're, uh, you've got a bird that makes weight. You're probably not going to have a bony bird, but you want to see the, you want to feel that nice, long, smooth back. And then the, the next step is to evaluate that keel. And uh, you've got that bird in the palm of your hand. Um, a good keel should be feel very comfortable in the palm of your hand. It should really fit. It should be smooth. You want it to be long. Uh, you want the you want the keel to end just below the pelvic bones in terms of length. Um, you can run your fingers down that keel. You're looking for bumps or wrinkles or twists. Those are all. Uh, problem areas. Um, ideally, like I said, you're looking for that long, smooth keel that just fits comfortably in your hands and you start handling birds, especially heavy birds. Keels can be an issue. Um, if they don't harden up and they're roosting as a young bird, um, keels, you know, soft keels can turn into bumpy and twisted keels. As, as I worked through, uh, my birds, I started with, uh, in a lot of cases, some lightweight hatchery birds. And so early on I was working on, you know, putting on weight on these birds and I didn't necessarily have a lot of keel issues, but as the birds, as my group developed and the birds got heavier, um, keel issues started to, started to emerge in some of the, in some of the lines. And so uh, keel's pretty important. And so as you can, you look at that and, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to see from a production standpoint that a long, wide bird is going to carry more weight and thus carry more meat. And in a lot of cases, um, even in some of your egg forward breeds, these heritage birds are dual purpose. And so you're going to want to sell these cull males. And so you want a good, uh, a good body on these birds. Um, my Erminettes, um, 
tend to have a long keel. They're a, they're, they're a big bird, they're a long bird with a kind of an upright carriage and a fairly long keel. And they don't get, uh, they don't put on that thick breast meat like, uh, like a Cornish cross does. But with that long keel, they put on a lot of breast meat along the keel. Uh, and so it's a, that's, you know, that's a definite uh, attribute that I look for when I'm breeding those birds. Next, you move to the back of the bird. <clears throat> and this is where you're gonna be, you're identifying uh, egg laying capacity. Um, the body depth and the pelvic width are two uh, attributes that uh, a lot of people believe, and I'm one of them, can, uh, can help you predict the uh, egg laying potential for these birds. And uh, the best way to, or what I like to do with that is uh, take that, take my fingers across the back of the bird and you're measuring the distance between the end of the keel bone and the pubic bones. And uh, of course, everybody's hands a little different, but you know, once you uh, are handling birds consistently, you can come up with your own uh, measurement system. But in my case, um, uh, I, I need to have a, at least three fingers of depth, body depth, before I'm gonna keep a bird. Um, my light laying favorels have a hard time uh, uh, getting to that. And, but they only lay about 160 eggs a year. But my well summers and ermanettes, um, a lot of times I'm, I'm three fingers all the way to four fingers deep uh, laying across the back of that bird. And uh, that's a pretty good pre predictor of capacity. So now you've looked at the, the body, you know, length and width, and now you're looking at the depth of that thing. And you know, a lot of that depth capacity is their ability to, to uh, have produce eggs and have them queued up in production so that they can lay an egg a day. And so that's a very significant uh, attribute. Um, it's one that uh, Walter Hogan identified and talks extensively about in uh, Call of the Hen. And he was in, in 1914, he was one of the first ones to identify these attributes and and really uh, speak to uh, their potential in, in uh, improving breeding birds from a, from a laying capacity standpoint. And so the next thing I measure is the pelvic width. And uh, Karen had a couple of great slides showing, showing the, the C-shaped pelvis and those two examples, um, one of which was there was a nice opening there um, in my birds. You know, I'm looking for a, a finger and a half to two fingers wide there is uh, is where I'm at um, from a production standpoint. But you can get a hold of birds that you can barely get one finger between the, the two pelvic bones. And uh, in Karen's case with her slides, you know, that that uh, bird on the on the right was definitely an example of that. And as she noted that uh, that hen or the males that that hen or that or the hens that that male creates with those tight pelvic bones, uh, passing eggs are gonna be uncomfortable for them. And so they're gonna do less of it. And so to me, body depth and that pelvic width are uh, your two very, very significant uh, indicators of egg capacity and something that uh, when I was when I was starting with birds, uh, again hatchery quality birds, that was a, a big area of emphasis for me is finding birds that uh, had above average laying capacities and keeping those birds, and that translated into improved uh, egg production. Lastly, we've got feet and color. Uh, obviously, feet are a st important structurally. Um, you're looking for good legs, good feet, straight toes. Um, it's important, depending on your breed, that your the color of the feet are the appropriate color. Um, some birds are white skinned and have white legs and feet. Some birds are yellow skinned. Karen had an example of appropriate leg color for her Osterlorps. Um, but a lot of time with, with feet, you're, you're looking at those birds standing up and uh, 
you're, you're looking for a good strong stance, good wide stance, um, birds that move well. And then uh, color is, I, I have it last. Um, obviously we want these birds to look like um, they're members of the breed, they belong to this breed, but I'm a firm advocate of build a barn and then paint it. That's how I was taught and I, I still believe that. And so, you know, it kind of depends on where you're at in the process. I really spent a lot of time with my birds early getting their bodies in shape and kind of, uh, I didn't ignore color, but I just didn't emphasize it. I wasn't going to keep a, a bird with poor type because it had excellent color. I was more apt to keep a bird with excellent type that had poor color. And unless you, you know, just make a total mess of your, of your flock, you can come back and clean the color up later. But, uh, I like the idea of, of having good productive birds and then giving yourself an opportunity to work on color. And so when I went through, you know, just every, everything I've done in terms of breeding is I really emphasize the body, the type, the egg production, those utility characteristics, and then combs and color were really the, the two things that uh, I saved for last. And actually today, you know, six years in with a couple of these breeds, um, that is kind of what I'm working on now is uh, I feel like I've got uh, bodies on these birds where they need to be. No bird's ever perfect and there's certainly room for improvement. But now that uh, I've got things kind of where I want to be in that respect, I can uh, emphasize uh, color and combs, which are more uh, aesthetic attributes. I don't know that they, they don't necessarily affect production, but to Karen's point, you still want your birds to, you want a well summer to look like a well summer. You want an ostrilorp to look like an ostrilorp. And, uh, you know, both of those things are important. I do, uh, <clears throat> with my Arminettes, um, coloration was a really important part of their attribute. That's one of their unique features. And so I did have to spend a little more time with color and, and bring it up in terms of an area emphasis and, and balance it against uh, against utility characteristics because it was an attribute that I didn't really want to lose. And so, uh, but with my other birds, uh, utility came first. And so kind of to wrap this thing up, in the end, you can only breed what you have. And so depending on what you start with, if, uh, if you get good birds from a, from a well-known breeder, a, a good breeder, um, you're not going to have a lot of projects to work with. You're going to, you're going to be making, uh, pretty small choices between birds. But if you're starting with hatchery stock or kind of starting a reclamation project, um, you're going to have to make some decisions and you're going to end up, uh, you know, breeding some birds that, that, show, I don't, I wouldn't say defects, but maybe weaknesses and in, in various attributes. And so it's really up to you as an individual breeder to kind of understand what your priorities are and uh, select from them. And with that in mind, um, the other reason that I, I like the spreadsheet is if you've got some characteristics that you feel like you need to work on, it's pretty easy to change your formulas and weight some of these categories a little differently. Um, I did that early on with my birds, emphasizing overall body weight and uh, the body depth and pelvic width and, and giving them more weight than some of the other attributes in the formula. But again, that's an individual breeder trick. And uh, you can do that as, as it fits your priorities. But uh, I, uh, that's, that's the beauty of a spreadsheet. And the other, the other thing I like about it is you can use it to compare birds that, uh, are, you know, were hatched in different hatches. So as you can see on the, on the example, I got some birds that were hatched on the 13th of January and some birds that hatched on the 2nd of February. And it, as long as you're consistent with doing all your evaluations in that 16th week, you should have a pretty good apples to apples comparison from uh, birds uh, in different hatches, and it'll also allow you to measure improvement from year on year. So it's a 
to me, it's a very important kind of tool and uh, it allows you to, it can become a part of your permanent record and help you uh, improve year on year. That's it, Mike.